Ah, Lasso tattering the nanda oh mm tani so first I just <coughs> want to offer my greetings and tashi dele uh, to all of you who have come to join us here for this teaching about the differences between the great vehicle and the foundational vehicle of Buddhist teachings. And so first off, I'll start you with a quotation from a text that says, uh, if your intention is wholesome, then the place that you are and the path that you traverse will also be wholesome. But if your intention is unwholesome or negative, then the place that you will be will be negative and the path that you traverse will be negative. And so since everything relies upon this wholesome intention, you should always make efforts to generate it. And so also for us, the Buddha said that in the future, um, that there are two great ways that people will um, will accumulate um, um, will improve themselves or will accumulate um, you know merits and so forth and that is by um, anyone who with a respectful mind explains the Dharma and anyone else with a respectful mind listens to the Dharma mm, that's all. So keep that in mind as we begin these teachings and uh, as you listen to these teachings. And and so to begin with the teachings that we're going to hear about, first of all, we should um, understand that there were three, what we call the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma or the three kind of sets of teachings that the Buddha gave the um, the teacher, our teacher, who was the perfect, complete Buddha. And so those were the first, uh, what we can call the first turning of the wheel of Dharma, the first teachings of the Buddha, which he gave in the town of Varanasi, the second, which he gave at the Vulture's Peak Mountain, and the third, which he gave at uh, Shravasti and some other, um, what we call, refer to as an uncertain location. So many different various locations. <laughs> Uh, 
चलो मजों दिखे तेने चेला फाचे चलो मजों तो लो नाबजिया दौ सेंदो तिबजा जागाला फे अब से चमाता So as for the the person who gave these teachings, who turned this wheel of Dharma, uh, the Buddha, uh, there are different sources which say when exactly the Buddha was taught or when the Buddha was born. And some say he was born 563 years before the common era. Some that say 485 years before the common era, and so forth. So there are different sources with different uh, dates ascribing to the birth of the Buddha. But anyway. Uh, it, at some time around then, the Buddha was born to his father, whose name was Setsang, and his mother, whose name was uh, <clears throat> um, uh, Maya. Uh, Mahamaya. Mahamaya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maya Devi. Maya Devi. And then, the Duke of the Valley, Chetang, Chit Jagal, Yigi, Mepat, and the Dang Samaritan, and the Duke of the And at that time, um, it's unlikely that there was no written language in India, but there were very few of the Buddhist teachings that were written down at that exact time. It was, there are many, many stories uh, of the arhats and the other uh, accomplished beings accomplished disciples who memorized and committed to memory the buddhist teachings hmm then ทิปะชิชงซามากดอเรเตเตเตนิกลาซังจีสมบาเฮจงวาตังเตเตนิกลาซังมาจีบะจิอ่าเซกุรวาลตาเปนติเคนตาติเจนะซังจีนิลายัน
ตีจาบตันทําจินดบิจาบุเตลาตะกาจินชิรบเซจมนะปาตบนะมะจวะเมกาเซจิปาติตันตันคอนเรดตะตีกบตะนาคุงกตินชิรบเตเซจิเนม
As well as the Buddha's, you know, miraculous powers and clairvoyances and so forth are also, you know, accepted and, and presented both in the Mahayana, uh, the great vehicle teachings and in the foundational vehicle teachings. It's not as if they are only talked about in one and not at the other. And if you want to think of, you know, what the Buddha's, you know, his clothing and so forth might have resembled. If you look at the monastics who <clears throat> still abide uh, in Sri Lanka, then he wore clothing exactly like that. And in the and then uh, the Buddha was one who held the, the perfect view and the, the excellent conduct of nonviolence. And so, and it is that Congo Petty Namzala, the man, no one of the master. And then, uh, you know, the clothing that was permitted, you know, the Buddha, the Buddha gave permission for monastics to wear three colors of clothing, which were um, red, yellow, and blue. And so anyway, um, you know, they wear uh, more of a yellow colored robes, whereas uh, where we wear uh, red colored robes and in China, they wear some different kinds of blue robes and so forth. So those are just, you know, different ways of wearing robes, but they're all carrying on the tradition of the Buddha. That's it. And then that's it. Yeah, that's it. And then that's it. Not so much. That's it. Uh, and if we think about, you know, what the Buddha might have resembled, you know, how he would have dressed and carried himself and so forth. <clears throat> then, you know, the most common understanding of how the Buddha was would be in accordance with the way that these, uh, these people from the Theravada countries and so forth, mm. from the countries of the foundational vehicle that they would have, um, mm. you know, that they wear and the way they conduct themselves and so forth. Mm. The and so, but then, um, you know, the Buddha had disciples who would receive all of his teachings, you know, uh, that they were um, certain teachings that were open to anyone and that were given to the, the general public. And then some other teachings, such as some of the teachings in the Mahayana tradition, which were not given to everyone, that they were more restricted or given to a, um, a more select group of disciples, uh, of students. So, but there were many of those students who received both of those teachings like Shariputra and Mughlayana and Ananda and so forth, as well as many other beings, many other, as I say in the texts, uh, you know, gods and nagas and so forth. 
anyway, so the Buddha taught many different teachings and there were different disciples that were able to receive those teachings. Some of those teachings were common and some of those were more restricted. So there's, you know, these teachings of the foundational vehicle teachings, Mahayana teachings, and then the very particular, very special teachings of the Vajrayana. ตมุงเหยียจิตมุงมาอินบาจิสุสุกะโลมามิเสตินเลเหยจิงินเนดาวจิติสันตวะเตอินเนติสันตะตาอินเดเนติสุเจติตาพะเจมิงพะเจชิ
Pachere dang aso ching dong ha ni ka chiyong de ta jya cha. Ta gop jya, ta gop jya kogun rao de te ne pyo gun nong na yoy de ji te ta sanji ki chun yung zo rao ji. Ye ba che li ya. Ani yen da de so ta te le ma te ni cha che. Ta nyunga nyunga cha do huyo re ba la. Pe na tipa chunga gong ta na te kyan ya do tika la. Pe na da ta da di jya na dang da de so tam ji di te kyan re do re ba. Te chung li ye yi tipa yoy yo ka te na te kyan ji. Ta nga me do re. And so what is most commonly, you know, talked about when we're talking about the different levels of Buddhist teachings is that there are these three levels. There's that foundational vehicle teachings, there's the Mahayana teachings, and then there are the Tantric teachings or Vajrayana teachings. And that those are all the teachings of the Buddha. And so uh, it is in Tibet that those, you know, three levels of teachings are, you know, held to the highest percentage if we're thinking of other places in the world. Like, for example, in most of the Chinese tradition, they just have the foundational vehicle, of course. And then in addition to that, they have general Mahayana Buddhism, but not Tantric Buddhism. So that's an incomplete <clears throat> aspect if you're talking about the complete picture of what the Buddha taught. And so it is in Tibet that the, the most of the Buddhist teachings are preserved and practiced. So the reason why what I'm talking about here to summarize is that you know, we have all these different levels of the Buddhist teachings. So I'm taking this from the perspective that the Buddha, you know, that, that all of those are the Buddhist teachings, the foundational teaching, the Mahayana Buddhism, general Mahayana Buddhism, and Tantric Buddhism. And we're going to talk about the differences between those. And so I'm not going to talk too much and give everyone a headache here today. Yeah. And then this one's a chain of baga, oh, that's cheap. And so, you know, it's, I'm, I'm assuming here that there are many of you who have studied or, or practiced in like both of these traditions, uh, you know, the foundational vehicle teachings as well as Mahayana teachings, or some of you who have some basic understanding of those teachings. And so I'm just here to give some more information about that. Okay. Tangye tata di chechu dung. Dung goni any chechu jiyagi yus. And so the distinction that I'm going to make here is there's a, a presentation in some of our texts which are called the seven distinguishing features. So that's what we're going to talk about. Tangye and and so I'm going to give a little explanation here. Um, this is coming from teachings of Maitreya Buddha, who is one of the 1002 um, you know, Buddhas of the fortunate eon, he will be the fifth of those Buddhas. So this is found in one of his teachings, which is called the ornament of the Mahayana Sutras, the Mahayana Sutra, Sutra Lankara. And in, in the Nyingma teachings is found in Longchenpa's um, treasury, the Yishinzu. And then also in Mipa Rinpoche's teachings in his entry or gateway to knowledge, the Kenju teachings. And so anyway, these are Coming down primarily, all of those are explaining from uh, Maitreya Buddha's teachings in the Mahayana Sutra Lankara, which is the foundational source of this material. Okay, so now I'm going to finally get into the first of those distinctions. <laughs> 
so the first distinction <clears throat> is um you know the distinction of having or of wearing the armor of great diligence and so the distinction here is between whether you're wearing that armor of great diligence or not Uh, <clears throat> And so what is meant by this uh, or, uh, sorry, the, the armor of, of uh, diligence. And so, you know, in the Mahayana <laughs> teachings, we, we, we don the armor of our mind, which is that commitment that we're going to work for the benefit of beings until all sentient beings attain Buddhahood. So that really is like an armor that that commitment is like an armor that we wear in our mind. And so we, we, are thinking then of, of all living beings, of all sentient beings. And we uh, take that, you know, as our commitment with this great diligence. And so that really is, and definitely is a particular feature, a distinction, a distinct feature of the Mahayana. Mm. <laughs> And so like in uh, the in the Mahayana, when we're talking about this great, um, this armor of, of diligence, then we can think of like even the greatest amongst the Mahayana of like uh, Manjushri and Avalokiteshvara. So there's different types of generation of bodhicitta. One is said to be the generation of bodhicitta, which is like a shepherd. And so their, their commitment is that I won't attain Buddhahood. I will continue working for others and not attain Buddhahood until everyone else has attained Buddhahood before me. So that's, mm. that's the type of, uh, <clears throat> you know, armor that we're talking about. And so thinking of the foundational vehicle then, you know, even their, you know, root texts of their practice are named the Individual Liberation Sutra. <laughs> and so what that means is that, um, you know, that is not referencing, you know, anything about um, working for all beings. It is a method for liberating oneself from samsara. And some people get a mistaken impression from this when they hear the Mahayana talk in this way that these people in the foundational vehicle that they um, that mm. they only think of themselves and they have no concern for others, but that's really not the case. You know, there's even you know specific instructions within their teachings about taking mm. care of your own um, students and your spiritual community and like the sponsors uh, who 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 provide you with food and everything like <laughs> that. There's particular kind of prayers that they recite, uh, you know, to to dedicate and to make aspirations for the for the people who provide from them and they take care of their disciples and so forth. It's just a distinction between um you know thinking of them and focusing on the welfare of all living beings so 
And when we talk about wearing the armor, we're really talking about that generation of the mind of enlightenment, <clears throat> that you know, expanding one's <clears throat> your concern <clears throat> outwards to, to all living beings, to a limitless beings. And so it's a difference between having a limitless um, you know, attitude of, of bodhicitta or limitless <clears throat> attitude of uh, your interest in enlightenment versus a limited <clears throat> perspective on that. And so if any of you guys have any <clears throat> questions later on, just keep those uh, in mind. And I'm going to go through each of these seven points in brief. And then if there's <clears throat> any questions or doubts about that, we can discuss that a bit. <clears throat> so now we're on to the second point. The second of these distinctions is the distinction of um um and so then this, the second one is the um the um <clears throat> focus upon the true reality which is expansive like space and so it's it's about the the vastness <clears throat> of the view of reality ตัวเดลไม่เนี่ยชุนิลไม่เขียวเลยเออไปชาลไม่ดีกว่าชุนิจัดเชมบอสเนี่ยชุนิโกรยิงโคราน่ะเขียดดีกว่าเนาะยิ
and so then um anyway generally speaking when we're talking about uh the the types of practitioners of the foundational vehicle then you know what's generally talked about is that they're focusing their practice on the, the teachings of the four noble truths and that from that they realize you know their their instruction is to look upon their body and try and see if their self exists and try and find that self and then they they realize that the self doesn't exist they know that intellectually they realize that experientially and they manifest that they fully fully manifest the full realization and uh, meaning of selflessness and so that's their mm. level of realization where in the Mahayana teachings it says that the, <coughs> the Mahayana you know, disciples realize that all phenomena, all objects of knowledge, so they describe that as from, from basic form all the way to the omniscient mind of the Buddha, that all of those things are um our our <clears throat> emptiness so they realize the true nature of every of, of all phenomena and so that's somebody like that drop a chimbo security that uh round on the bottom you don't drop a say that did you need to buy chimbo to you know the round on the any bundle to one match a yen down the same time check it down to but they can you read and then third is mm-hmm. what's called the great, the great practice or the great accomplishment. And so what's meant by that um, is by being great is that in the Mahayana teachings, then one accomplishes the welfare of both oneself and others. So uh, they perfect the for their for their self-benefit, you could say they perfect their practice of. Uh, abandoning all of their faults and um, realizing everything to be realized and then they continue with that level of realization to benefit others Mm -hmm. and so in the uh, foundational vehicle teachings then it is considered that they are fundamentally or primarily only focused on their own welfare ตาอีฮิชิมโบเซเกอเรตาเตตาอีฮิชิมโบเซเดงเดเดโตโซจิโกนิเกอเรตาเจตังตาฮิติเนเตสเนเรโดเกอเรตะบาลาตาฮิม
<clears throat> that in the Mahayana, that, that Mahayana practitioners realize this reality with this great <clears throat> mind of primordial wisdom, which is absent in the foundational vehicle. <clears throat> ติจุนติตาคังซากิดาเซอุนติงาตางายเชปะดินซิงยาวะดีอะนี่เดเมติตอบะตังอะนี่เดเลคังซากิดาเมสเจอร์ชุจันตะโซวะเจอร์ชุ
And so then, um, if I am, you know, this this person, I am this arhat. So what I did was I examined myself in that way, seeking seeking that self and so forth, and then realizing that selflessness, having seen that selflessness, then I rest in a meditative equipoise in that state of selflessness. And then when I have that full manifestation of that realization, then all of my afflictive obscurations, all of my afflictions, my mental and emotional afflictions are abandoned, and I attain this state that we call our hardship. Mm-hmm. So it's they say that there are still uh, you know people in Thailand who are accomplishing this state of our hardship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so then when we talk about our huts, we, we talk about them in two ways. We say an our hut with remainder. <coughs> And an arhat without remainder. So, what does it mean to be an arhat with, with remainder? It means that uh, you still have this body. So, you have eliminated the foe or the enemy of your afflictions. <clears throat> so, you've defeated them. That's kind of a, a meaning of the word arhat. But, you know, there were a lot of these arhats that, even though they had attained arhatship, they were still there in presence of the Buddha, receiving teachings and running around and doing things. So, that's what's called a, an arhat with remainder because their body is still with them. And then when at a certain point, when they actually, you know, their physical body dies, then that they no longer have that physical um, body left over, then that's what's called our hot ship without remainder. And so in uh, there's a there's a, a text uh, and uh, the Sanjay Gitomre Vela, the Chiriji uh, Gitomre. It's a sutra of the Buddha, and I, I don't know the Sanskrit title of it. It's called Chiriji Gitom in, in Tibet. <laughs> and uh, it might be Dhammapada, but I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, there's a, 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 a verse in there where the Buddha describes the state of our hardship. And it basically, it describes it as a state when the continuity of your five aggregates has been completely cut off. So there's no longer any continuity of your form, um, feeling, um, conditioning factors, perceptions, or consciousness. Uh-huh. And then, so what they say, this is the, the explanation from the foundational vehicle themselves, <clears throat> that at that point they, re- they attain the, the permanent state of peace. And so they would consider that, they present that, um, that um, our hardship without remainder as the ultimate goal of the path. So now let me say a few things about the our hardship with remainder. So when they still have their body. And 
Dragon but some much bad of Mareta. Kahila pet the Zumbra monkey pet, sure pen and took the job up and monger the pot. Young Dragon Tamchi young than the mind but the yores. Tell a genji the gemmes or a gense on the pet, Zumbra the monkey gente, tongue take down, Zumbra monkey gente, matabi dragon, then the yajo, or Dragon Corona, cheaper than the yajo. And, and then even inside of that description of, of our hut <clears throat> with remainder, they're not all the same. So even though they have uh, overcome their afflictive thoughts and emotions within their mind, there's a difference in uh, the, the, the literal te- terminology is those who are adorned and those who are not adorned or ornamented and unornamented. And what that means is that some of them have <coughs> greater powers of clairvoyance and magical powers and so forth. So they are adorned and some mm-hmm. of them who don't. So like um, Mugliana is like an example of a, of a disciple who had these great powers of clairvoyance and so forth. And some of them didn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so then they also say that there's differences, you know, in some arhats that even though they have attained or have uh, abandoned all of their afflictive thoughts and emotions that, you know, we talk about the faults, some of the faults of meditative concentration that people can fall into mm-hmm. like laziness or sleepiness and dullness. And so there are um, some who that when they attain our hotship together with that attainment, they also overcome those defects of their meditative concentration of dullness and so forth. And others who, even though they have abandoned those um, afflictive thoughts and emotions, you know, if they hadn't abandoned those, they wouldn't be considered our hots. But even though they had abandoned those afflictive thoughts and emotions, that they still um, have those defects in their meditative concentration. The the so here go with Jim Sen Cardes, details go carchmochado, ma tropatella. Cardes is the dinner, carriage, do said him. Ah, Dratum Bachani, Pumbo Junchen, only there, Jago Dua. Young Dratum Bachala, Dratum Nanula, young, cheaper than a dog daughter. D. Naso Cogo daughter, and Naji Cassidy Jim Prodam, he damn the egg cheaper and doa. Young Simogla so bad in day, then Niki Chali Madrova Tendra, Dogata. Oh, that thing as a Kogu is. So, my whole reason for even bringing up this particular distinction is because it's going to be important for us in the, the, the sixth point, in the next point. And so, um, so what, what we're talking about to summarize again is that, you know, when we talk about the ultimate level of our hot ship, then that is the cutting off of the stream of all of your aggregates. But while they still have their body, even as they have attained our hutship, they have overcome their afflictive thoughts and emotions. There are still differences between those arhats. So some of them, like I said before, have more or less power over um, their clairvoyance and miraculous display, and um, that some of them have been able to abandon all of the faults of their meditation, such as dullness and lethargy and so forth, where others have not. Okay, so that's a conclusion of the points that were made in five, and or uh, yeah, and so now I'm going to talk about number six. Ta truba de la ta truba chimbo top su sanji di yon de tse me pa se do ta pe na ta truba chimbo gun ta tok de ta ta muni ribe truba chimbo re wala ta ribe truba re wala. ตาเดลาเตนตอบเจมเจไปเจเซนตาซานจีลันเซนดาเปเจฮิวเฮจอร์ตาติเฮจิติเยตราเดโซตาติปะเชมโบเกตาซานจีลอลเตเฮียอน
the four fearlessnesses, the eight, um, the eight particular or unmixed dharmas, and so forth, all of the major and minor signs of Buddhahood and so forth. So we say that this is the great, uh, the great accomplishment or the great result. And so that that level of that great result of Buddhahood is doesn't exist that is not able to be accomplished by just practicing the fund, fundamental vehicles practices so they that practice will not bring you to this great result so I'm going to go into seven because uh, it's connected. And if I try and explain six alone, I'm going to mix it into seven. So let's just talk about seven. And so the seventh is the the great enlightened activities. <clears throat> And so uh, that is those enlightened activities which will carry on working for others until the end of samsara. And so then, uh, you know, in the arhatship, at that state of arhatship, which is the ultimate result of the fun fundamental vehicles practice, then one's physical form and one's, you know, mind or awareness, the stream of that, the continuity of those, all of those factors are cut off. So there's no more, no more continuity of form or awareness or anything. Whereas in the Mahayana tradition, that's mm -hmm. distinguished. In the Mahayana tradition, it said that even though the continuity of ordinary, like afflicted mind is cut off, there is a continuity or a continuation of the Buddha's primordial wisdom, okay. which enacts these great activities mm -hmm. until the end of samsara. So uh, the in the foundation found, fundamental vehicle, then there is a cut off. There is a, a, a cessation, an utter cessation of the... Um, physical and mental um, events that could ever work for others. And so there's no way for them to, to work for others after that attainment of cessation. Whereas uh, in the Mahayana tradition, the great result is Buddhahood, which has no such cessation. And so to summarize, we went through seven points here. And of those seven, the first five are all causes. And the final two are the results. And so those first five, so because the, the final two are talking about that resultant state of Buddhahood and activity. And so then those first five are all the causes which will lead you to attain that result of Buddhahood. And so what's being said here is that these are from the Mahayana perspective, these are seven ways that the Mahayana, you know, tradition is um, su supersedes the, the fundamental vehicle. And so to summarize here, what I'm what we've been talking about is that if you consider yourself a Mahayana practitioner, then you should have these seven factors. You should work with these seven factors. You should be endowed with these. So you need this great <coughs> armor, don't you? And so we also need to <coughs> focus upon that vast, um, vast aspect of true reality. 
Tene drip do ya rangi ni ka ta do go da sa ba pen drip ra chi ma rangi ni ka ta do go da. When you are practicing, uh, then mm. you need to be practicing for the benefit of both yourself and others. Ta sem ge chi pa o so go go ni chi pa ya na ya ko yi hi chi mo da da me ni ka ta to go da. And when we think about the way of realizing that true reality that's like space, then we have that distinction of the mind which will realize that, that primordial wisdom which need to realize both kinds of selflessness. And then on the next one, um, the, the, the great skillful means, then, you know, it's extraordinarily important in the Mahayana tradition to have both factors of that discriminating intelligence and wisdom and, or that wisdom of that discriminating intelligence and compassion. And so it's extraordinarily important because um, without that compassion, then we'll just be kind of like in a sleepy type of state of peace. And so it is that great compassion which spurns us on or which drives us to not abide in that peace and to work for others. And so these five are the most five most important factors for those of us who are here working on this and practicing a path. And so then, um, you know, we're talking about ways that we should be considering things as well as ways that we should realize things by way of wisdom and compassion. And so if we have all of those factors in place, then we will attain the results, which are those final two factors. And so we will attain Buddhahood and together with that Buddhahood, we'll have unceasing enlightened activities for the benefit of others. So if you have the correct result in place, then, or I mean the correct causes in place, then the results will come about, right? Okay. So I got one more thing to say as we're concluding here. So one thing we need to really understand when we're talking about or thinking about the way that the Buddha taught is that the Buddha was taught teaching to people according to the levels of their minds or according to the levels of their stages of their practice. And so we need to understand that otherwise we'll get into a, a you know a mistaken way of thinking that you know that the foundational vehicle teachings are something totally different and that the Mahayana teachings are something totally different and that Vajrayana is yet again something different. Um, but that's not the case. It's that the Buddha was teaching according to people's capacities or levels and stages of progress along a path. But even and so in that way, there become three kind of stages of teachings or three stages of practice. But ultimately, they all will bring one ultimately to the same place. There's only one place that they are going or that they would lead you to. So it's like this, you know, for example, if you, um, you know, the very first teachings, the beginning teachings are kind of like the way you would talk about this to an ordinary, just general person. But then as that general person's mind kind of developed, then it's inappropriate to just keeping talking to them in that general way that you need to move forward into something into the next level. So it's like that. So we've already been through one hour of teaching. So if any, I'm going to stop here, but if any of you guys have any questions, we could take some questions.
So you guys can type those in the chat. I'm not sure if you're able to turn your microphones on or not, but you could type them in the chat. You should be able to turn your microphones on now if you want to ask a question out loud. I drink water. Hmm? Oh, me, Landy. The madam, me. Then I say, Steve. All right. It seems like no one has any questions, but if you do have a question and you're slowly typing it, maybe let me know, or else we're going to conclude here. Ring it to the checkers in a sietana, somebody in a jetana sauce. La. Ring it to the checkers in a sietana. Uh, I was thinking that I would try and finish the main topic here in half an hour today, but I didn't, I wasn't able to do it. But I think maybe it worked out perfect because I talked for half an hour and Justin <laughs> talked for half an hour. So. And so my final thing to mention to you is that this discussion of um, distinguishing the Mahayana from the funda fun fundamental vehicle, the foundational mm -hmm. vehicle, is not a uh, um, you know not a matter of of bias or um, sectarianism, but is a, a a matter of if you consider yourself a Mahayana practitioner, then these are you know necessary aspects that you should include in your practice. Yeah. And so then, you know, finally, mm. to, to bring that back around, what that means is that um, if you don't have any of these points, contained within your practice, but you consider yourself a Mahayana person or a Mahayana practitioner, then even though the Dharma that you, you know, claim to be practicing, maybe Mahayana Dharma, you are not a Mahayana practitioner, not a Mahayana person. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, everyone for coming to the teaching. And it was nice to be here with you. Thank you to Justin. Two segura, four segura. Yeah, thank you to Justin. Okay. So non be tamje zibani to nini be dona bande ni chega na je wala chuba ni si be tole droa droa shu tamje senjuru rimbuji ma je banam ji 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 banyam ba me ba yang gone gone de pe wa shu. Okay.